For Oasis Audio, I'm Wayne Shepherd talking with Kathleen Falsani, the author of Belieber! Exclamation Point, subtitled Fame, Faith, and the Heart of Justin Bieber. Kathleen is an award-winning religion journalist and author specializing in the intersection of spirituality and pop culture. She's well known for her personal interview profiles of a long list of notables, including Barack Obama, Bono of U2, Anne Rice, and many, many others. Kathleen, thanks for your time today. Oh, it's my great pleasure to be with you. Now, full disclosure, you and I are having this conversation, and you're still writing Belieber, right? Uh, indeed I am, yes. So, what's it going to be like? Well, I hope it's going to be both interesting and inspiring for, for readers, especially those who are already fans of, of Justin, but um, more than that, also for people who maybe aren't fans, maybe are curious, um, and particularly for the parents of a lot of the believers, most of whom are, you know, tweens and teenagers, mm-hmm. to kind of give them a little bit of more insight into this passion that their child or their kid has and why and what it might mean and whether it's a good or a scary thing. Um, and to sort of broaden the conversation about how faith is expressed in popular culture and how music and television and, and movies and superstars like Justin Bieber can reflect back that faith and and shape the faith of those who are fans of his. Well, I'm kind of glad to talk to you today because it's going to be fun to talk about the making of the book (laughs) as we uh, go along here. But let me ask you this. Uh, Many people dismiss uh, Justin Bieber and anyone else who rises to fame as a pop culture icon. Mm -hmm. They're dismissed as frivolous or sometimes even dangerous to anyone who's truly serious and spiritual. You look at it differently. How so? I do. Well, I mean, part of it is rooted in my own experience as a kid, um, as a teenager, and and looking back now, at, I'm 40 years old now, and the mother of a about to be 12 year old myself, looking back on the things that I was passionate about when I was younger and how they have shaped my life. Um, when I was 13, 15 years old, I was a massive fan of U2. And rather obsessed, particularly with Bono, um, totally infatuated, thought he was just the coolest in every way, pretty much still do, by the way. <laughs> um, even now that I know him a bit, um, my opinion of him has not changed a lick since well, I was 13. Good. You know, looking back on it, um, my parents were, were concerned, I think, um, had some misgivings at least about the ferocity of, of sort of my interest in U2 and in Bono when I was a teenager. And, um when when I look at the arc of my life and the story of my life, particularly my spiritual journey, um, it's really obvious, really evident to me how much that interest in their music um, and what they said in their songs and then going forward, some of the activism that Bono and other members of the group were involved in at the time and certainly over the last 25 years um, really made an indelible impression not only on my faith but on the way I see the world. Um, and I think it was uh, an impression in a very positive way, um, in a very powerful way. You see it as a force for good, then? It can be, and certainly in my life it was. Um, now, U2 is far from a boy band, you know, so when you're looking at someone like Justin Bieber, it <laughs> yeah. seems a little more frivolous, a little more um, saccharine or, or something silly, uh, because he is young and because he does sing a lot about things like puppy love and a very kind of chaste, sweet idea of infatuation and attraction, but he sings about more than that. And um, moreover, he has a really compelling personal story and a personal faith that, to my eye at least, seems not only really genuine um, and really humble, but really all-consuming in terms of how he lives his life, how he makes his music, the people that he um, allies himself with, and how he treats his fans and what he says in the world and what he does in the world. Um, and I think it would behoove adults, grown-ups, parents, teachers, youth group workers, pastors, to pay closer attention to the passions of these young people and not dismiss them out of hand as just something frivolous or silly. Because often when there's a passion like there is among so many of Bieber's fans, um, as somebody who's a culture watcher for a living, when I see something that is as epic as this fan base is, and the passions that are expressed in the way that they are by many of his fans, I tend to think think that there's something spiritual going on at the root. And certainly with Justin, I think that's exactly what's going on. I think people are attracted to him, his fans are attracted to him, and loyal to him, and protective of him, 
because he is so very special and because at the heart of who he is is this um, very humble, very pure, um, love-forward faith in Jesus Christ. And if you didn't pay attention, you might miss that. And if you dismissed it, you'd be making a mistake. So if you were, let's say, an 11-year-old girl at home today, yes. would your parents discourage you from uh, being a fan of Justin's? Um, my parents? Yeah. <laughs> uh, with what they know today, no. At the time, they probably wouldn't have given it much of a second thought. Okay. Um, because he is so cute, and because <laughs> what you hear first is, "Oh my gosh, he's so cute! Oh my gosh, his hair! I want to, I want to marry him!" So I that love him that, so much. that trumps everything, huh? Well, you know that that's what you hear first, but you have to understand that that's the the easiest way for for kids that age to express something more profound. Sometimes, yeah, they don't have and the when, words, do they? They don't have the words quite. But if you dig a little bit deeper, um, I have found in speaking with many fans, some of whom I know quite well, my niece and my nephew. Um, that's what's there. If they don't maybe have a way to articulate it as eloquently as uh, would be easier for their parents to understand, but if you if you start kind of peeling back a bit, that's there's something different hmm. about their interest in him that's underneath the the hair and the cuteness and the purple. I have not been to one of his concerts. I think I probably would be disqualified from attending one of his concerts. But uh, in what overt ways do you think that his faith is expressed in his concerts or in his music or in his, his uh, guest appearances on you know, countless television shows? What have, what have mm-hmm. you observed? Well, um, I have yet to hear him play live, but I'm hoping to. He's just, coming, he's just finishing up um, a world tour at the moment today. He's in Hong Kong as I'm talking to you. and. He goes from there to Japan for two more concerts before he wraps things up on the end of in, toward the end of May in 2011. Um, and then I, I understand he's going back into the studio to work on a new album, which I imagine he will be supporting with another tour quite soon. And I hope to be able to see him play live then. But I have, that said, I have watched a lot of clips of his concerts. I certainly have seen his his amazing film Never Say Never, which is an extraordinarily inspiring film, even if you're not a fan. Um, he rarely misses an opportunity to say something that affirms to his fans, and, at least, and maybe not even affirms, introduces the idea to some of them that God loves them. Um, he always blesses his audience. He often says that at the end of the show that God loves them, and he wants them to know that. Um, he prays before every sh- every show, and there's some really great footage of him praying with his his mother, Patty Millette, and his manager, Scooter Braun, and his whole crew and backup dancers and stuff before his show at Madison Square Garden in that film. Um, it's a video clip that has gone viral around the world. Um, his mother prays, he prays, and he even prays um, the very important prayer in the Jewish tradition, the Shema, um, acknowledging God as, as the all-powerful and the maker of all things, which was his manager, Scooter Braun, who's Jewish, taught him to pray. Um, so those things are all very public, and he's not shy. When he's asked about his faith, he steps right up and talks about it. On numerous talk shows and even on the red carpet, um, he is quick to attribute all of his success and all of his blessings to God. Um, he continually says that God is the, is the one person who keeps him sane, um, that he doesn't know what he would do without God in his life. Um, he talks often about the power of prayer, which is clearly something that he's learned from his mother, Patty, who is a prayer warrior, um, who covers her son and everyone around them in prayer on a regular basis. There's a whole uh, network of people in his native Canada from their church and outside who pray for them on a regular basis, on a rolling basis. Um, and again, you know, he doesn't try to couch or parse or give caveats Um, to anything he says about his faith. And yet, when he does talk about it, he has a a profound humility about it that's uncommon among many believers, um, never mind 17-year-old believers. It's it's a very open, welcoming face of what it means to be a Christian believer. And uh, I'm very grateful for that as a Christian believer myself, and I'm heartened by how he expresses what is obviously, to me at least, and I think this is true, um, a very genuine, uh, very tender faith. Don't you wonder what uh, all this uh, media pressure, all the fame and 
yes, fortune and, you know, yeah. the success of the documentary and all that, all, all that working together, don't you wonder what kind of effect that will have on him in the next five and ten years? Oh, uh, uh, of course I do. And, um, you know, he is a young man. He's, I keep calling him the lad. He's, he's a wonderful lad, but he's still a lad, and he's very aware that he's a kid. Um, it's something he says often. Um, one of the things I, it, I like about Justin in, in terms of his openness and his relationship with his fans is that he is an epic tweeter on Twitter. He's nine and a half million followers, which I think is more than anybody else on Twitter right now. I'll, and that's come in the last two years. He wrote his first tweet, I think, in March of 2009. Um, he, you know, he tweets everything from the incredibly profound to the to- totally ridiculous and trivial and what comes through, and I've read all 7,000 of his tweets. Is that right? Really. Um, <laughs> it, you get a picture, you get a glimpse into the mind and the heart of this kid. And when he's frustrated, he says that. And when he is angry, it comes out. Um, and then when he realizes that he's missed the mark, he comes back around and he apologizes and he, he self-corrects and he encourages people to do the right thing. Anyone who has teenagers, it sounds pretty normal. You know, he's a really normal kid. I mean, his tweets go from everything, you know, I remember laughing one day reading, uh, he ran out of proactive solution. He was worried about what he was going to wash his face with, you know. Um, but then anytime he hears about something um, cataclysmic or something tragic, for instance, the you know earthquakes in Japan, he's the first one to hop right on and say prayers for Japan and then keep going huh. about how he's praying for the protection of these people and how much he loves Japan. and. Um, so that's there. And then, you know, he's on this particular world tour. He went to Israel for the first time, and that was quite an experience for him. Um, obviously something that meant quite a lot to him um, as a person of faith. And it wasn't the easiest experience because his fame got in the way. Um, he was dogged by the paparazzi when he was trying to go visit some sacred sites, and he got really angry. And he kind of stomped around like you would. <laughs> and he threatened to stay in his hotel room for the rest of the tour. And he threatened to take a, a break from Twitter. And, of course, came back about 12 hours later. But, you know, when he did come back after he cooled down a bit, he talked about how patience is a virtue and how he, you know, doesn't want his fans to think it was them. And he's frustrated and that it wasn't all the paparazzi. It was just some of them. But, you know, he... he when in those moments when he was really frustrated, um, tweeting at about three o'clock in the morning, uh, Tel Aviv time, if I'm not mistaken, you know, he he was so frustrated that he couldn't have the experience that so many other people have gone to the Holy Land to have. He just wanted to walk in the places where Jesus walked. That was one of the things that he tweeted. Um, so he, you know, he's aware how much his life has changed in just a few short years. This is not a child who grew up in the industry. This is not a a product of the Disney factory. This is a kid who was about as average, well, about as normal as you can get growing up in a, in a small town in Ontario, Canada, and was discovered kind of overnight on YouTube after his mom posted video of him singing in a contest like so many other parents do, just so her friends and family who weren't there could see it. And um, he went from being a normal kid with extraordinary talent Um, and his mother believes a prophetic call on his life, which I see clearly as well, to rising to the upper echelons of uber stardom. (laughs) There are only a few people on the planet whose name is more recognizable than his. So, you know, it's changed his reality. I don't know how much it's changed him. His mother travels with him everywhere. Um, She's surrounded him with really good people who try to keep him as normal as possible. Um, his, His manager, Scooter, talks... Um, in interviews a lot, he's asked this question, how do you keep Justin from heading down the path that a lot of other child stars have gone down, even kids who come from the same kind of spiritual background that he does? How do you, how do you make sure he doesn't burn out and just fade away? And he talks, Scooter talks about how they are determined to not treat him like a star. They are determined to keep him as normal as possible. And they keep him on a very short leash. And Scooter talks about the fastest way to get fired from the Bieber nation (laughs) is to treat him like a superstar. Uh If you indulge him, you're gone. And I think that's really um, wise. And I think Patty, his mom, has been really discerning about the people that are closest to him and that basically form his family 
that tour with him all over the world and that work with him and help him create music and help keep him healthy. Um, so that's a testament to the last two years, the success of, of keeping him normal. And going forward, you know, he's going to be 18. He's becoming a young man. And we all make mistakes, and I'm sure he's going to make some too. But he's, he's grounded in a way that is um, encouraging to me that he's not going to go too far afield. I think about the verse that in the Bible that talks about raise, raise a child up um, in the way in which he should go, and when he's an old man, he'll, he'll return to it. You know, I don't think Justin is going to slip down a slippery soap, slope and stay there. You know, he's, he's got so much scripture and so, in his heart and so much prayer that has bathed him and continues to bathe him that I think he's going to be just fine. And I can't wait to see what he does. Very interesting to hear you talk about that. You've obviously done a lot of research. I know you're still working on the manuscript, as we said. Uh, you will hopefully have a chance to talk to Justin, interview him? That is my hope and my prayer. Um, you know, Justin is a super, superstar. And when yeah, you but are you, a super you've talked, to, you've talked know, to Bono. But it, and <laughs> <laughs> but it takes a while to get the request into the hands and the eyes of the right person, and that's what we're doing. And he's been on um, in a world tour since we started working on this project. So okay. you know, we're being patient, but I really I do feel um, like it would be a good experience for him to be able to sit and talk with me. To be in, And I've done this with so many other people, including the president, and you know other superstars to help them express their ideas about faith and their beliefs and their doubts and their struggles um, in a way that they're the people who are interested in what they have to say their fans will really resonate with that's i'm sort of a cultural translator hmm. and i hope to have the opportunity to do that with justin i think he's fascinating and i'd love to talk to him um, much more about what he really believes and his hopes for the future and his fears and uh, the call that his mother believes he has on his life that I think he, he has a clue about as well and where that might take him. So, you know, we're praying for favor, and we're <laughs> praying for grace, and if, if God wants me to talk to Justin Bieber, then Justin Bieber will be talking to me. And we'll know the outcome by the time yeah, people hold this edition of the audiobook. so all will be told Indeed. by that time. Yeah. Indeed. Kathleen, let's talk about your career. Uh, sure. For many years I read you in the Chicago Sun-Times. You were a columnist there, but mm -hmm. uh, no longer? No, I, I was at the Sun Times for about ten years. Um, I came on board and uh, as actually a suburban reporter briefly, and then quickly became the religion writer, which is my specialty and what I was trained to do in graduate school. And um, after about a year, uh, I was also given a column, so I did both. I was a religion writer and a, relig a religion reporter, I should say, and a religion columnist. Um, and I, I did that uh, all the way through my first and second books, um, taking hiatuses to work on those projects and then coming back eventually just as the columnist. Um, and then when my family moved to California in July of 2009, I continued to do my column from here for about six months. And then with uh, the news business being what it is um, and cutbacks happening, um, they weren't able to keep me on, which was sad. Um, so I left the paper finally in January of 2010. Um, but during that time, I had also been uh, a contributing columnist for Religion News Service in Washington, which is a national wire service. And uh, when I cycled out of the Sun-Times, I cycled into writing pretty much exclusively for RNS, mm -hmm. which has been a real joy, um, sort of casting an eye in a more um, national way than I was able to do on a regular basis at the Sun-Times. So we can read you at the uh, RNS uh, website at this point in time? Well, yes, you can you can read my my columns. I write twice weekly under the heading of God stuff, um, which is kind of a hybrid between a column and a um, news analysis commentary, um, and that's uh, religionnews.com. But my my stuff also appears regularly at the Huffington Post dot com uh -huh. um, on their religion site and other places as well. Um, a lot of my columns get picked up by uh, newspapers and websites uh, nationwide and overseas to a certain extent. And I'm also a contributing editor and a columnist for Sojourners Magazine. I've done that for a number of years as well, where I write um, once every two months or so. That might be by the time this book is published, once every month. Um, so that's what I'm up to. And I do a lot of uh, guest columnizing and um, appearances on radio and occasionally on TV, too, talking about what I'm seeing out there in the world of faith. must be great fun for you to do what you do and to follow the, uh, the stories that you'd like to follow. It, it is great fun. I, I've I've been blessed to, for 15 years and a little bit more than that now, um, 
be able to write about almost exclusively the things that I was really the most interested in when I decided to become a journalist, which was um, the life of faith in all of its various permutations. I didn't have a particular interest in writing about um, religious institutions. That gets boring very quickly. (laughs) But I wanted to write about the places that are a little more counterintuitive for some people, the places that some people say God isn't supposed to be showing up, and the places in my own life um, that have had uh, a a more indelible, uh, more dynamic influence on my my life and my faith. And that, for me, has been music and film predominantly, and some of the people who make those kinds of art um, and and what they say and what they do and what they put out there in the world. And when I was at the Sun-Times in particular, um, my editor... um, got what I was trying to do and saw that there was a way to talk about these bigger, more universal, more serious, for lack of a better word, issues, um, these enduring eternal issues, by casting them inside of a far more pal- palatable or accessible package, which the conduit was pop culture. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not talking about anything frivolous. It just happens to be the inroad that I'm using to talk about things that are anything but frivolous. Um, and so it's been a it's been a great joy when I was at the Sun Times. One in one year in particular, they gave me a lot of uh, free reign, which was a marvelous blessing. Um, in one year, I w- I spent time at the Vatican and also at the Playboy Mansion, both on assignment as the religion reporter. So, you know, um, how many we, people we, can say that? I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think I might be the only one. And also the same year in the dugout of Wrigley Field. Oh, boy. Um, now that's house impressive. House of worship, if there ever was one. That is impressive. <laughs> <laughs> is there anyone more faithful than Cub fans? Come on. <laughs> the substance of things hoped no. for and the evidence of things not yeah. yet seen. Well, I are one, as they say. So <laughs> yes. I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, Kathleen, people can read more about you and follow uh, your career at your own website. Give us the address of that site. Uh, yes, it's KathleenFalsani.com. Um, or godgirl, G-O-D-G-R-R-L, dot com. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you about in conclusion. Where did God Girl come from? <laughs> oh, boy, that's a nickname that a, a media creature friend of mine, um, a wonderful, talented writer, very successful magazine and, and book author named Bill Zamey. Oh, yeah. Uh, who's a Chicagoan, gave me a number of years ago, at, actually, to, tie, to come full circle back to Bono. I had just um, come off the road traveling with Bono for about 10 days when he was doing his Heart of America tour with his organization that is now called One um, back in 2002. Uh, He was trying to get um, the American church, the evangelical church in particular, to sort of pay attention to the AIDS emergency in sub-Saharan Africa. I'm happy to say that eight years, nine years later, he was tremendously successful in those attempts, but I traveled with him. I was the only reporter who traveled with him the whole time, and I traveled specifically as the religion columnist. And we okay. talked a lot about faith, and it was an unbelievable experience, and he's just a peach. I love him to death. So I came off the road, and I went to meet some of my colleagues, like you do, in Chicago in a um, tavern, and I walked in, and and uh, Bill, who's quite tall, I think he's six six, <laughs> yells from the back of the the bar, hey, God, girl, and it just kind of stuck. <laughs> it just sort of stuck. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's a term of endearment. Yep. And, uh, yeah, they call me God, girl. I don't know how long I can hang on to that girl well, now not that bad. I'm 40. Not, God, gal yeah, doesn't have yeah, the same well, ring. <laughs> you, you can keep it as long as you want. Well, thank you. Uh, Kathleen <laughs> Falsani, the author of the latest book, Be Lieber, subtitled Fame, Faith, and the Heart of Justin Bieber. Uh, Kathleen, great to talk with you again, and uh, good luck with this book, and thanks for the insight, uh, the inside insight into what's going on right now as you prepare the manuscript. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk to you. For Oasis Audio, I'm Wayne Shepard.